Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Just a few announcements here before we get started. Uh, you may have noticed that we've got a new logo. You'll see that in various uh, different forms. Uh, we've also updated our website, which has been long overdue. So if you go there, uh, you're going to see some stuff that you haven't seen before. Uh, before I forget, I wanted to point out the fact that from the time, the day, from the day that President Trump took office to the day that he was acquitted of impeachment was 1,111 days. Just found that interesting. Uh, for those of you who have maybe uh, perhaps uh, forgotten or never knew why, what our explanation was uh, as far as what happened on September, uh, on uh, the Re at the Revelation 12 sign, September 23rd, 2017. You'll you'll read about that on our website. Uh, I've also, uh, due to uh, numerous requests, uh, uh, I just decided to go ahead and spend some extra time writing some small booklets that are now available on Barnes & Noble. Uh, the first volume is, is out there already. Uh, it'll be a, uh, this will be a series if I continue doing this. Uh, it'll go on past uh, uh, the seven volume series that we've begun. Just depends on how long we're going to be here. And so, uh, if you haven't been following us, uh, you can follow us on Facebook and on YouTube both. I do ask that you uh, please click like, share, and subscribe if you feel led. Now we've been studying together in the Epistle of Jude. It's been quite an interesting study. It's a very short epistle, but it's packed full of dynamic truth. And in our last study, we were somewhere around verse 17. Before we get started, uh, just a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to feast together on your word. I just ask that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher and seal to our hearts only that which is truth, striking out any, any error, any foolishness, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. So, I believe we're, we left off somewhere around verse 17. So it begins, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you want to, you can say, well, you know, see, See, look, Steve, look how much Jude loved these people. And I have no doubt that that's true. But I want you to see something vastly more important than that. And I've tried to point this out in every single one of our studies. The Holy Spirit is the one that's writing these words to you. God always calls you loved. He never calls you a sinner. He calls you a saint, in fact. On multiple occasions, He calls you a saint. If you're a believer in Christ, you're a saint. And oh, that you might know the love of Christ. You know, if you could just stop focusing on your love for Him, you know, which oftentimes fails, and just think about His love for you, because it's unchanging that you might know the love of Christ, the one who, who does exceedingly above all that you can ask or think. Now, most, I probably shouldn't say most, but at least many of your Christian friends are absolutely convinced that God can be mad at you. If God can be angry at you, Christ didn't do enough. He's not the propitiation for your sin. And you can't do that, folks, with the Word of God. 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. If you know any of the background of Corinthians, 
these people were carnal. These people were living in sin. And the Holy Spirit begins to write to this congregation. The first chapter. And, and folks, if I had read that letter in Paul's day, I would have said, wow, now wait a minute. I mean, is he really going to say, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ? I, I always thank God for you because of the grace that He has given you in Christ Jesus. For in Him you have been enriched in every way in all speech and all knowledge. Well, Steve, I don't, I don't have all knowledge. What, what is that? To, no, we have His Word. That's what that's, that's saying. Because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly await the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. You're not lacking in anything. I issued a challenge uh, back some time ago uh, to people, friends on Facebook. I asked them to show me one play, just name, name one thing, one blessing that we haven't received in Christ. And you can't do that. We, we cannot do that. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. The text there in Corinthians says He will sustain you to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God who has called you into fellowship. God who has called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. Faithful. Carnal churches, I mean, you can find today wouldn't be as bad as they were at Corinth. The problem is that most of your Christian friends think that the Christian process is cleaning up the old man, making the flesh good. What I just read is absolutely true of every single new creation in Christ Jesus at Corinth, and it's absolutely true of every new creation in Christ Jesus today. You haven't come behind in any gift. Okay? The word there, there's two words in the Greek for gift. One is duron, one is charis, grace. The word is charis. You haven't, you're not coming behind in any grace, is what the text says. You are enriched in Him. God's peace, God's love rests upon you. And I'm beginning this video where we're at, verse 17 in Jude, beloved. Beloved. And I don't know how many Christians will just jump right over that. They won't spend much time really sitting, sitting there thinking about what the text is actually saying. You know, it's just a word, beloved. It's just kind of a name. It's, it's one of those terms of endearment. But, but, you know, I look at my life and God really doesn't love me all that much. Folks, that's not what the text is saying. I am absolutely persuaded that Christianity today is making a gallant effort to clean up the flesh, but God didn't make half Christians, folks. He didn't make good ones and He didn't make bad ones. Okay? What He did was He made perfect ones. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. I don't care who you are. You stand before Him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. The only word that He can use is beloved. I love you. It's a, it's a love far above common human love. It's, it's as far as the heavens are above the earth. God has never done anything but love you. He doesn't love you more one day than He does another. His love is not a variable. It's a constant. God has always loved you from before the, cre the creation, the foundation of the world. God will always love you. It doesn't matter what you do. Yep, that's right. It doesn't matter what you do. 
God loves you and always the answer comes back well Steve that's license okay has not the the potter power over the over the clay to make one vessel of honor and another to dishonor thou wilt say then unto me O man why does he yet find fault and if you don't get that question from people you're not teaching the truth of this book Or I'll hear some married woman say, well, if God loves me, I might as well just go out and do anything I want then. When, when that same wife, that same person, would probably not say that she loves her husband for better or for worse, sick or poor, sickness or in health, so, so now I can just go out and do anything that I want. What, what married woman says, I'm gonna love, I'm, I love my husband. I'm going to love him with, till, till death do his part. Doesn't matter what he does, I'm going to love him. Those were my vows. I said those vows before God. And folks, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not preaching a sermon on marriage here. I'm trying to get the point across that law is not the motivating factor. If, if there's any motivating factor, it's love. Why should Christians find it so difficult to believe that God loves us no matter how bad we act when you have, you, many of you have children that you love, that you'll never stop loving, it's, it's a constant. It's not a variable. And it doesn't matter whether they, they behave well or they behave poorly. You love them. And you would tell me that. And yet when it comes to spiritual things, now, oh no, now all of a sudden it's different. Now, you know, we're talking about God here. And somehow God now, we've made God less than man. Think about it, folks. Where did any Christian ever get the idea that law is a stronger chain than love? Do you serve Christ because you're afraid you might go to hell? Now, if, if you do, I, I really do pity you. Or do you serve Him because He loves you and you love Him? The strongest chain that you can possibly imagine is love. I love Him because He first loved me. One of the popular things going around today is God can't make you love Him. Well, of course He does. We love Him because He first loved us. If He didn't first love you, you wouldn't love Him. Don't, don't buy into that nonsense. Your love for Him is based upon the fact that He loves you. And the problem is we read past the word beloved and it occurs three times in the verses that we're going to look at here. Three times. Verse 17, verse 20, and I believe verse 21. We see God as, as a judge. You know, we can, we can see Him angry against sin. We can see Him as supremely powerful. We can see Him as sovereign. But it, it seems oddly difficult for many Christians to see Him as a God of love. Or, or we'll just voice that. But in our day-to-day -day experience, our day-to-day -day walk, there are times, many times, in which we come to question God's love. And I, I don't think we should ever do that. We, we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. He can say to the Corinthians, they have grace and peace and have come behind and no gift, enriched by Him. That's the new creation in Christ Jesus. And people will say, well, you know, it'd be nice if the flesh didn't have any part in your life, if God had just eradicated the flesh. And folks, I'm absolutely convinced that, that, it, that he, number one, He could have done that. I'm also equally convinced that He didn't do that. And I'm absolutely convinced that it, it at least one of the reasons God has not totally destroyed the old man, the flesh, the sinful nature, is so that we will learn more and more of His grace and His love. 
Another reason has to be that, that if He did destroy the flesh, where would the need for faith be? Faith is at the very center, the very heart of our relationship to God. We walk by faith, not by sight. Can it be? Can it really be true that the way that you live, He loves you? Absolutely. He absolutely loves you. Unconditionally. And it, it amazes me that we don't at least all have that one truth in common. But we don't. Sadly, we don't. And that love, folks, the love of God, not our love for Him, the love of God for us, it ought to grip our hearts like nothing ever did. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, these are the ones that He had sent. I think the question that we ought to ask ourselves here is, is who are we going to be listening to? The ones whom God sent, who went forth with words given them by the author of this epistle. And I'm not talking about Jude. He just merely held the pen. But the Holy Spirit remembered their words. Could that mean that we are not to listen to the ones that are speaking great swelling words, just back up a verse, which we saw was the verse before. Those who have crept in unaware. Even though God had ordained it, and clearly He said that He has, and it's amazing that I got comments on my last video where that, that's what the text says, that that God clearly ordained this, but I, I, I got at least a couple of comments that, it's, that, that correcting me on how that He didn't do that. Folks, how much does this book mean to you? Those who have crept in unaware. He, they, they were easy to follow, okay? Great swelling words. You know, God doesn't want you sick. He never wants you sick. God doesn't want you poor. God doesn't want you in an unhappy marriage. God doesn't... I mean, you can go on and on and on and on and on. Yeah, that makes sense. God doesn't want all that. God wants you to clean up the flesh. God wants you to tithe more. God expects you to earn your way to heaven. God wants you to experience an additional baptism. The, the initial baptism wasn't enough. When the Word clearly states one faith, one spirit, one baptism. Great swelling words. God told me this or that or the other thing. And uh, somebody says, well, the Lord spoke to me and He told me this or that and the other and, and then I listen to that and I, and, I, and I see it's not biblical. Great swelling words. Puffed up with pride. As I pointed out, you can, you can see it any day that you want to on TV. Just turn on one of the Christian channels and you'll hear those great swelling words. But you also hear them on YouTube website blogs, Facebook, articles, regular news, mainstream news, political debates, and at backyard barbecues. In fact, everyone will hear these everywhere, e everywhere, one or more are gathered. Great swelling words. The Holy Spirit, I believe, is, is saying here, let me direct your attention to God's Word. Okay? That's what it is. The apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who are they? They are the ones inspired by the Holy Spirit. Where should you look for answers? To those speakers on TV or radio or YouTube or Facebook or, or, or God's Word. We are told to test the Spirit's. 
Remember, the text says, the words that were spoken. That's a perfect passive. There isn't going to be any change in these words. They've been perfectly spoken. It's the Word of God. They're the ones sent by our Lord Jesus Christ. He sent them. I received a, a, an email from a lady in Israel who said, you know, the Holy Spirit had grabbed hold of her and, and she just had to put this message on the internet and it went on for, for pages. I was, so many pages, I, three or four pages. And all of it was trash. I'll be as blunt as I can be. It was trash. And yet she was inspired by the Holy Spirit. It had, it had changed her life. I hear these things all the time. Nothing she said in those five pages agreed with this book. You're going to say the Lord spoke to you when, when the Word clearly says that no new revelation is being given at this particular time in human history. That we now have all the revelation that we need. Well, somebody here lied. And I'm sure it wasn't God. I've taken you to Matthew 7 several times. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. And boy, can, can, can you hear that? We cast out devils in Your name, done many wonderful works. We heal the sick. Depart from Me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Crept in unawares. These are not God's children there but Satan's emissaries. If you want to see a messenger from Satan, look in the pulpit because he has arrayed his messengers as messengers of light. I repeat again, I, I've repeated it for years. I'll keep on repeating it. Do not believe me, folks. Believe this book. You are to examine these Scriptures to see whether or not these things be so. That's why I go verse by verse when it comes to teaching videos. What you hear from me must be judged by the Word of God. Remember those words. Call them to mind. I'm going to say this cautiously because I know that, that we are new creations in Christ Jesus. But from the standpoint of studying God's Word and knowing God's Word, many Christians I've talked to spend 95% of their time in what others have written. I've had them say to me, yeah, Steve, it's hard. I don't understand it. I'm not gifted to study it. So they read something else. And to some degree, you are influenced by what you read, whether it be God's Word or whether it be something else. You can read a Louis L'Amour Western and be influenced. I know, huh? Because I have. I'm not in any way suggesting that you shouldn't read things other than the Scriptures, folks. I hope you read the books that I'm going to publish because I think that they will help a lot of hurting, confused Christians. Now, I am suggesting, however, as strongly as I know how to suggest it, your emphasis ought to be on God's Word. It's the most precious thing that we can hold in our hands. What does it say? Remember these words. Not those great swelling words of these people that look great and try to take over the administration and the activities of the fellowship who are feasting with you without fear, without reverence or respect for God, who are wandering stars that you can't navigate by. That's what the text is saying. Any great swelling words you ought to compare with Scripture, folks. Verse 18, the word told there is an imperfect tense. It keeps telling. They keep on telling you. It, it expresses the idea of an unfinished transaction. I think it's something that was never completely done. They keep on telling you this, and you don't grasp it. 
Now, maybe I pushed the Greek a little too far. That might cause some discussion in a Greek class. I don't know. But I read it as they, they kept on telling you that there, that there should be mockers and you haven't gotten that yet. They're right there in your fellowship. And they're not God's children. And you ought to be able to know that by the... You just should know by, by being the noble Berean. You should know that by the Word of God. They've kept on telling you that there will be mockers and they will come in the last time. One word about the, the word mockers. We, we tend to, when we look at the word mockers, we automatically, our mind just snaps to, you know, well, they're mocking the rapture. That's not the context, folks. Mockers who should walk after their own lusts. We know from the epistles of John that we are in the last days. There is no doubt that we are in the last days. There's the expression last days. And there's the expression the last time here in Jude. There's the expression the day of the Lord. And there's another expression, the end of the age. You know, and some people lump all those together. This last time of verse 18 is, is, is all of those under different terminology. You know, if you can do that, hey, more power to you. I, I'm not going to tell you which way to go here. It's not, it's not that I don't believe God can dump all of those expressions into the same bucket. Because He can. I, I just think that if He had done that, He would not have felt it necessary to use multiple phrases or terminology, which He obviously did. Day of the Lord, last days, last time, end of the age. So what is it saying? I believe the phrase last time is an expression that infers Christ is not coming to die again. Just as we see the writer of, of Hebrews declare. What was the central point of all of human history and God's design? It was the cross. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, He declared it is finished. There's nothing to add to that. There's nothing else to be done. We're waiting in God's last time. It is the last time. Whether it's the, the wrath of God or the day of the Lord or the second coming or the kingdom until time is no more. I think it's related to what we read in the third verse. For the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. It's not going to be delivered again. Christ died once. Just as the phrase last time, I believe, is an expression that infers Christ is not coming to die on the cross again. There is no other faith to contend for. This is the last time and there will come mockers. I'm not trying to confuse you here. I, I believe we've been in the last days since the Lord ascended. But... I believe the last time goes clear from the cross to the eternal state. But so does the expression last day. Whereas day of the Lord goes from the second coming. Actually, the day of the Lord goes from the beginning of the tribulation. It's, 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 you'll find that expression day of the Lord in over 90 Old Testament references. It makes it absolutely clear that it begins after the church leaves and it goes... That day of the Lord goes all the way through the kingdom age, possibly even into eternity. That's the day of the Lord. I'm just suggesting that there may be more than meets the eye in the expression, the last time. So, moving on. These mockers are going to walk after their own desire, not after the Word of God. I believe that's what it's saying where that nothing that they say correlates 
with this book, even though they are absolutely convinced that it does. I hear it all the time. God told me to say this, and, and, you know, and then they say something that's not scriptural. But again, God has ordained it, just as He ordained Satan's testing of Job. So God has ordained the presence of these mockers, whether it's inside a brick and mortar building or it's out on the street, folks, or that those of you who really love the Lord and love His Word, that will drive you to study more. It'll drive you to study the Scriptures. Verse 19, these are they who separate themselves. Now there's, there's several ways you can look at that. I believe the text says that these are they who cause divisions. On the other hand, there are those who believe that the text says that these are they who, who separate themselves from other people and set themselves up as something above or higher, you know, more enlightened, more intelligent, more gifted, more, more controlled by the Holy Spirit you know, than you are. So you can take it either way. I think it's both. It's kind of, kind of like a man wears two, two shoes, you know. As I try to look at that expression, these are the ones who cause divisions. Everything they do is in the physical sense, sensual. They don't have the spirit. Now, what I find interesting is that the word the is not there in the original text, folks. I, I really wrestled over this. Without spirit is what the text says. I read that as worse than without the spirit. I mean, what an awful phrase, having not the spirit, but the definite article's not there. Again, maybe I'm pushing the Greek, but I'm just telling you what the text says. It doesn't say the spirit. I'll tell you how I see it. It's like animals. Natural instincts. Knee-jerk reactions. He's already made it clear that they're not His. It doesn't say the Spirit. It doesn't say a Spirit, which we know every man has. It just says Spirit not having in the original text. That's what it says. Almost without exception, they claim to have the Spirit. They claim to be speaking by the Spirit. They're slaying by the Spirit or whatever term they use. They're claiming an allegiance to the Spirit. And the Almighty God says, Spirit not having and doesn't articulate it. But that's not you. Now what you do with that, it's up to you. I'm just telling you what it says. And I will tell you that that's not you. Verse 20, But you, beloved, you, beloved. It took me a, a good many years studying this book before I realized God never called me a sinner. You know, I thought I was a sinner saved by grace. God says I'm one. He loved before the foundation of the world and, and still loves me, always has loved me, never has He ceased to love me. He loves me as a as much today as He loved me before, before I, I caught my first glimpse of sunlight as a baby. But you, beloved, we had a beloved in verse 17. Doesn't that make the word precious to you folks? I mean, this book is precious. Not, not what others write about or, or say. I read what other people write. Of course I do. I do the same research that anybody else does. But my first consideration is this book. But you, beloved, not ones who separate themselves, who are only physical, natural, as brute beasts, spirit not having, you have the spirit, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, and I don't think that that building up yourselves is to build a mega church or strive to, to gain a million YouTube followers who want their ears tickled with uh, the latest uh, you know, conspiracy theory or anything like that. Building up yourselves by means of your most holy faith. Is that my faith in Christ or is that Christ's faithfulness? I'll leave that to you to decide. I know what it is. I'll tell you what it is. 
without apology. I will firmly assert what it is. Is it my faith which is most holy? Or is it His faithfulness? I think you know what I think it means. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you're saved by means of faithfulness of that not of yourselves. It's God's gift, not of works, lest any man should boast. Or His workmanship created upon, the word is epi in the Greek, created upon good works. What good works were you created upon? Christ's work. His work. And it, it's those works that we're to walk in. I got a brother who says that, you know, you know, you were created for good works, therefore God expects you to go out and do good works. As I read that, I, I believe that you are created upon the faithful good works of Jesus Christ. He's the one who came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. Well, Steve, that means now we've got to fulfill the law. No, that's not what the text is saying. He fulfilled the law because we couldn't. You have Him now and you don't have law. Okay? The law wasn't given to you. We died to the law. What do you want? Law or Christ? You can't have both. You can have the fulfillment of the law in Christ. You can see yourself as having a person living in you who is the fulfillment of the law. But when you, you bring your own law keeping in alongside it, now you've, you just shoved Christ clear out of the way. Christians have the hardest time understanding that. So when those saints in Revelation are clothed with good works, it's the good works of Jesus Christ. It's the only way it can be. Not yours, but His. You can take that as your faith in Christ, or you can take that as the faithfulness of Christ. We should also worship in the Holy Spirit. We are directed to God's Word in the building up of ourselves. I believe in the faithfulness of of Jesus Christ, worshiping in the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. Not your love for Him, His love for you. Oh, Steve, He, he can't love me. I can see how God can love this, you know, uh, my sister or my mother or my husband or my best friend. The one I sit next to in Sunday meeting. Yeah, I know he loves them, but me, he can't love me. Well, then you don't understand grace. No, you just don't understand grace, and that's that's. And I, 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 I pity you because. I don't know, I, I just, I, I think you've just been fed a whole bucket full of lies your whole life. You haven't spent enough time in this book to know that what these people are telling you are cleverly devised fables. What is a Christian? What is a Christian? I'm going to close with this, with, this, with this remark. Let's look at what a Christian is. What is a Christian? A Christian is one who by the grace of God can declare that he justly deserves the wrath of God, but for the mercy of Jesus Christ alone. He casts aside all hope in his self-righteousness, and he puts away all pride in his own goodness. One who is glad to be regarded as spiritually bankrupt, saved by the free grace and righteousness of Jesus Christ, and by the sheer mercy of God has been granted a grateful heart which yields in allegiance to Him alone as Lord and supremely sovereign. In a word, it's one who glories in Christ Jesus and has no confidence in the flesh. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I stumbled on this on Got Questions. Uh, Got Questions is, is a place 
many Christians go to for answers. I'm sure that the Lord has used this, uh, this ministry uh, wisely. doesn't mean they're always correct, but I've, I found it kind of startling when I came across this. I'll have you look at this as I close down uh, this, this part here in, in Jude. Keep looking up. Keep yourselves in the love of, of God, folks. We're going home soon. Till next time. Thanks for watching.